God has set this day before us, a day set apart, a day of rest and praise. God has set our lives before us, a span of years in which we love and learn and serve. God has set God's seal upon our hearts so that we might live fully in deep love. Let us worship God. Good day, everyone. My name is Jeff Frederick, and as the provost of Wingate University, I welcome you to the 2021 baccalaureate service. The last 15 months have been beyond our wildest imagination, with a disruption to university life on all levels and a pandemic impact felt in one way or another by every household. Across the country and the globe, family members face severe illness and death, rising medical and hospital bills, disruption of income or loss of jobs, and the toll of not seeing loved ones, hugging friends, and gathering at the places that fill us up when we are depleted. Church, restaurants, concerts, museums, and ball games. And yet we will gather on the quad to celebrate commencement, an indication that even in the midst of all of what you have confronted, you have overcome. We honor your persistence and your adaptability, the grace you provided others in your journey, and the strong work you did against all odds to reach this milestone. On balance, baccalaureate services usually provide an opportunity for reflection. Thinking through what you have accomplished, the blessings that have accompanied the journey to this moment, and the blessings that will carry you ahead from this moment going forward. A university has many parts, each of which are required to work together. As one small example, your professors taught you, but they are dependent on the library to carry research materials, on the bookstore to stock required books, and on the IT department to create and maintain a digital network. And all of us are dependent on the facilities team to keep the buildings and grounds operational, safe, and up to date. Even in an individual accomplishment, we are connected to something larger. And this may be true of you as well. It is your accomplishment this baccalaureate and commencement season, and we celebrate your hard work. But in reflecting one of the key aspects of a baccalaureate service, be sure to remember that parent or parents, that teacher, that coach or advisor, your partner or spouse, your grandparent, pastor, or next door neighbor that somehow, sometime, gave you a bit of strength last week, last year, or last decade to make sure all of this could happen. I celebrate your hard work and individual accomplishment, but I note the interdependence we have upon each other. One study recently noted that the average American might spend up to an hour a day in front of a mirror facing their reflection. Some of that is shaving, brushing our teeth, washing our face, or making sure our tie or jewelry is on just right. But some of it might just be trying to get a sense of reflecting on who we are in a particular moment. Another study indicated that folks who spend 15 minutes at the end of each day reflecting on what they accomplished that day can be more settled, more assured of their work, and more productive moving forward. There is value then in reflection. Take a moment as you watch this service and in the days moving forward to reflect on what you have achieved and on who has helped you to get to this point. Thank you for choosing Wingate and trusting us to help you on your journey to now. Congratulations.
My name is Reverend Dane Jordan. I'm the Director of Student Ministries here at Wingate University. Congratulations on your achievements. Let us pray. Almighty and benevolent God, we thank you for the journey. The journey that we have all gone through as students, as faculty, and staff to bring us to this place, this place of achievement, this place of happiness, this place of, of a future that will lead us all into a better world. May you give us joy and peace as we go into an unknown world with an unknown life. May you give us direction and guidance that will lead us into places of opportunity, of significance, and of the ability to care for the world in which we live. We thank you for those who have made this day possible. Grade school teachers, mentors, high school teachers, college professors, staff that have all helped in bringing the culmination of this day. May we continue to pay it forward, to give unto others as it has been given to us, and to lead lives of significance and service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hello, family, friends, faculty, staff, and to the graduating class of 2021. My name is Tatiana Only. I have been invited to come and share my experience at Wingate as well as my faith journey during that time. In my four years here, I have had the privilege of being a first year senator in SGA, Miss Black Student Union, a peer mentor, the vice president of the Black Student Union, a resident assistant, a convocation speaker, an office assistant, an orientation leader and director, the athletics intern, and last but not least, a student. Many of you might be wondering, how did she do all of this? Well, the answer is simple, through faith. From the hard test to the all-nighters, I know my faith in God has grown so much during my time here. I know I'm not the only one that can attest to the last few years being stressful or even a bit overwhelming, but in times when I felt the most stressed or overwhelmed, my faith came through for me. Even if our beliefs are different, you have made it past 100% of the most stressful and overwhelming days in your life. And that is why this graduation is such a celebration. Think about it. You're graduating from a college or Zoom during a pandemic. That is not a walk in the park or on a promenade, whichever one you prefer. You have worked hard to walk across this stage this weekend and you deserve it. Don't let this time go by without expressing some sort of gratitude whether that be to God, to your parents, Ethel K, or even to the Klondike. We arrived here in 2017, the largest class that Wingate had ever seen, and we handled business. For me personally, I know that I would not have made it through college without God and the prayer of my family and friends. Embarking on our next journey, let's not forget to show gratitude and take the world by storm. Congratulations, class of 2021, we made it.
Hello, and congratulations, fellow graduates. My name is Martha Wren, and I'm a psychology major graduating this year. I was honored to be invited to speak today, and I want to focus my words on celebrating us as a family of bulldogs, composed of all faiths, all backgrounds, and all belief systems. Some of us here believe in the God of Christianity, others in Allah of Islam, others of us find solace in science, in meditation, and some of us may be about to graduate and still not have a clue. That's me. I'm not ashamed to say that I'm here to represent those of us who still wonder, those of us who may see the good in each pathway, or those of us who may want no part in any of it. I'm here to say that still wondering does not make us failures, nor does it make us less than. Most importantly, it does not mean we cannot be people of great faith. When I showed up for my first class at Wingate, I was stressed. What would it be like being so much older than my fellow students? Would I be mocked? Would I be able to find friendship? But I soon discovered that the Wingate love is real. I made some unlikely friends with some guys in my intro to theater class. I made a friend in Gateway who I explored campus with. And I found a group of strong women to get me through PE. I commiserated with people in my first math class in over a decade. And as I settled into my psychology major, I met some of the most amazing people around. These newfound relationships showed me the strength of the Wingate community. I have faith in that friendship. When the COVID pandemic and subsequent quarantine hit our household last spring, I enjoyed the time at home with my family, sure that everyone would be back to school and work soon enough. A year of struggles, tears, and fights later, I've watched my family and my children band together in ways that we never would have had the opportunity to without this crisis. Y'all, it has been hard, but we are coming out of the other side stronger for it. I have faith in family. I'm a mother of three, my last of which was just born a few months ago in February. When he ended up in the hospital at two weeks old needing emergency surgery, nurses, doctors, surgeons rushed to take care of both of us. He's now a happy, healthy, cooing three-month-old. I have faith in science and in medicine. Being at Wingate has helped me come to terms with this aspect of who I am. Before, I would panic over my confusion and doubts surrounding religion, certain that I was somehow failing at a core piece of who I was supposed to be. I remember turning my papers in to Dr. Cobb and GPS 110, certain that she was going to hear how jaded I was and judge me for it. Instead, she was encouraging in my explorations into what I believed and eager to hear my perspectives. A year later, I turned in a Flipgrid assignment to Dr. Chilton for GPS 310, only to completely panic over what I had just turned in. I quickly emailed her, apologetic and assuring her that I had nothing but respect for her as an ordained minister, but that my life experiences in the church had made me bitter. She emailed me back, saying that I was not alone in this and there was nothing to apologize for. These classes and professors at Wingate helped me to feel seen and accepted as I am. My classmates helped renew my faith, and I can stand here now and say to those of you like me who just do not know where you fall in your beliefs surrounding religion, that's okay. We are okay. Find solace in the people who inspire you and fill you with hope. Continue to be the kind, open-minded, welcoming people that I fell in love with. And remember, we are one dog for life. I cannot wait to see where all we go. I've recently found myself repeating, for such a time as this, as a sort of self-pep talk when facing a difficult decision. Maybe you too have a mantra you repeat to remind yourself you are capable and prepared and that our Creator has equipped you for such a time as this. The phrase, for such a time as this, is frequently quoted, but rarely with context. It originates from the Bible story of Esther. Esther was a Jewish woman who lost both her parents and was cared for by her cousin, Mordecai. As the story goes, Esther became part of the king of Persia's royal court and eventually won favor with the king. But it wasn't until Mordecai called upon her to stop a plot set in motion to kill her people that she was challenged to let go of fear and personal ambition. Esther realized her bigger purpose was to ensure the safety of others by revealing the planned genocide. 
In that time, however, it was unlawful to come before the king uninvited. In fact, it could result in death. So Esther had a choice, reach out to the king with her request and potentially be killed or stand up for her people and be the instrument to save them. She chose the latter. Six words for such a time as this became a defining moment for Esther. And while all of us have been disrupted in one way or another in recent months, prompting perhaps more motivating mantras of late, there are far worse anchors for healing and reimagining ourselves than faith, knowledge, and service, the principles of your alma mater. Upon graduation and in this post-coronavirus world, there will be decisions to be made. Consider carefully those values by which you make those decisions. So before the pomp and circumstance propels you into the wider world, maybe some introspection will remind you that your responsibility in this life includes something larger than yourself. You have prospects and purposes, thanks in part to your education at Wingate, the work you do after you leave this place will indeed matter to many. Be like Esther, a difference maker. Stand up for others and don't hide in the shadows. Be compassionate, faith-filled, courageous and hopeful. And like Esther, you are ready for such a time as this. Best wishes and Godspeed on your journey. Hi, my name is Bailey and I graduated from Wingate last spring as a double major in math business and religious studies. I'm now a graduate student at Yale pursuing a master's in religious studies with a concentration in New Testament and early Christianity. During my time at Wingate, my studies greatly informed my perception of faith, specifically thinking about my coursework and research on ancient Christianities and Second Temple Judaism. Studies of ancient people highlight the ways that cult, or for our purposes, ancient faith-based communities contributed to identity building in the ancient world. Paul defines early Jesus-following communities in relation to hapistus, this difficult-to-translate, heavily nuanced word that represents faith, the faithfulness of other people, the faithfulness of gods to people, the accountability of relationships built on mutual trust, the knowingness of trust that gives way to strength. Faith in oneself and in others creates strength and identity and community. While my studies helped me gain perspective on faith, my relationships with my peers and mentors at Wingate illustrated it. For me, faith is about accountability, horizontal in nature and necessary for building strong, worthwhile relationships with ourselves and with other people. Paul's use of hapistus informs the way I identify within myself, a relationship of trust and accountability that empowers and emboldens but also in guiding the ways that I interact with other people and the way that I've come to understand that we each have the power to create the sense of strength and knowingness in community together, whether that be while at Wingate or in the journey that begins after. I leave you now with a quote from the Nag Hammadi text, The Thunder Perfect Mind. Quote, For I am knowledge and ignorance, I am shame and boldness, I am unashamed, I am ashamed, I am strength and I am fear, I am war and I am peace, give heed to me, I am the disgraced and the exalted one. Hi, my name is uh, Isaac Cook and uh, I'm going to be reading Acts 4.32 today. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said to any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And also I'm going to be reading Acts 28, 30, and 31. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. It is my privilege to introduce this year's baccalaureate preacher, the Reverend Dr. Willie James Jennings. Dr. Jennings is known for his work in race and ethics and is associate professor of systematic theology and Africana studies at Yale Divinity School. I first met Dr. Jennings some years back at a national theology conference where as a nerdy PhD student, I was pretty pleased to be able to add a picture of myself with him to my famous theologians album on Facebook. 
Dr. Jennings earned his Master of Divinity at my alma mater, Fuller Seminary, and his PhD at Duke Divinity School. He has served in various North Carolina Baptist and Presbyterian churches as pulpit supply, associate, and interim ministers. Not only does he span the Baptist-Presbyterian divides, but also the North-South divides. His writings include Whiteness and Education in Belonging, The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race, and a Theological Commentary on the Biblical Book of Acts. In this commentary, reflecting on his social justice work with the Moral Monday movement in North Carolina, Dr. Jennings writes, I felt the spirit at work in the common. A protest march is a fleeting moment, even if it lasts for several hours. But it is exactly in such fleeting moments that we can sometimes sense the permanent presence of the Spirit of God who never tires, never ceases to demand justice for love's sake, and never ceases to love a world mired in injustice. Please welcome with me this year's preacher, the Reverend Dr. Willie James Jennings. Good morning to President Brown and Provost Frederick, to the faculty, staff, students, and especially the graduating class of Wingate University, and to your families and friends, I am thankful for the singular honor of offering this baccalaureate address to you today. I bring you warmest greetings from Dean Gregory Sterling, the faculty, the staff, and the students of Yale Divinity School. It is a joy for me to share in this celebratory moment with you, even in virtual space. For a few moments, I'd like to draw your attention to the final verses of the Book of Acts, where we find Paul frustrated and incarcerated. His frustrations are part of his ongoing conversations with his own people over what he believes God is doing in the world. There in the heart of the Roman Empire, Paul is trying to explain to his folk the revolutionary new thing that the God of Israel has done and is doing through Jesus. The old order, the old order in all its manifestations, social, political, religious, and economic, has been overturned and is now, is now beginning to crumble from within. But Paul's people understand and seem to appreciate more than Paul where they are. They are in Rome, in the heart of the old order, and no one seems to have gotten this memo about this new order created and inaugurated in Jesus of Nazareth. As far as Paul's people in Rome are concerned, there is no room in Rome for theological experimentation and certainly not new political projects unless you want to end up like Paul, incarcerated. If the frustrations are old yet expected, so too is his incarceration. He has been jailed before, a Roman citizen, yet incarcerated. This one who has traveled everywhere now cannot go anywhere. House arrest. That is the term we should use for this moment when Paul is living under constrained conditions. On the one hand, he has not yet broken through to his people, not yet convinced them that a new order is here of Jew and Gentile living life together with new political and social possibilities joined together. And on the other hand, he is being held captive because of a political system and a judicial system being used to silence him and even destroy him. He cannot break through and he cannot leave. I think all of us now 
have a keener sense of what it means to live under constrained conditions, where your hopes are pressed hard, even incarcerated by difficult realities. And my friends, we are in the midst of difficult realities. Yet Paul, in the midst of his constrained condition, enacts a future for himself in which he becomes a place. He decides to open up where he is, to open his story, share his journey, and announce the new thing that God is doing and wants to do in this world to all who would come, all who would want to talk with him. He will, with courage and conviction, open his life. What does it mean to become a place? I don't mean to have a place, but to become a place. Now, it may seem odd to you for me to speak of a person as a place, but I'm referring here to a kind of becoming through which you become a place of meeting, through which you become a place of gathering that opens up for people new possibilities of thriving life together, even in, especially in, confined, confining spaces. These pandemic days, these Black Lives Matter days, these grotesque inequities in everything days requires a new vision of what we might become collectively and what you might become individually. I am reminded of the 1963 Martin Luther King Jr. No, not the harmless image he has become in our time, but the one who became a lightning rod by drawing diverse people together in a shared project of black abolition, a shared project of black liberation, who from a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama, wrote those famous words that many of us know so well. And I quote, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again, never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outsider, agitator idea. King saw connection and sought to build connection. That is what is required to become a place of meeting, my friends, where new possibilities can be imagined. Now, I want to be clear here. I need to be clear here. To become a place of meeting is not to envision yourself in that fictive middle position between liberal and conservative. For so many of us, our social vision has collapsed down into that mindless duality, that stupefying binary of liberal or conservative. And so we are pressed to imagine that the heart of our moral work now is to get liberals and conservatives to talk respectfully to one another. That is not being a place of meeting, my friends. That is becoming a place of confusion. Everything comes down to how you see and build connection. We, especially in the Western world, have inherited one way of seeing and building connection. It is a vision in which we are all connected by being 
competitors, struggling over the same resources, bent on exploiting and on guard against being exploited. Through this vision, we build connection in order to profit and to secure ourselves against threats. Much of Western education is captured in this vision of connection, and it aims to capture you in it. It aims to turn your life toward the individual quest for thriving. Most graduates I meet, they don't. They don't want their lives collapsed down into an individual quest for thriving. And I believe that most of you listening to me, if not all of you listening to me, don't want it either. But in order for this not to happen, it requires that you and I desire something different. Let's call it, let's call it a subversive desire. A subversive desire to see and build, to see and build a different kind of connection. The kind of connection that in many ways pushes against the very trajectory of Western education. Again, the words of King, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects all indirectly. Never again. Let's stop right there with the never again. This pandemic has brought us into a never again moment. The Black Lives Matter moment has brought us into a never again moment. The hatred and violence aimed at the Asian community has brought us into a never again moment. Never again has to do with overturning one way of connecting, bound by greed and exploitation, bound by hatred and fear, and living toward another way of connecting, bound by the desire to see and build thriving life, to see it made real all around you. So I invite you, I invite you all into a subversive desire, a desire to become a place where people thrive, a desire that moves you and I beyond simply being those who are not impediments to people's thriving. My friends, that is such a low bar for living to simply not being an impediment where people are free to pursue their individual quest for thriving. That low bar for living and working and dreaming and thinking will not meet this moment. This moment requires people who wish to place their bodies as living conduits who make their lives bridges where knowledge and ideas and resources and opportunities and hopes and dreams flow back and forth between peoples and communities that have refused connection and resisted collaboration. This moment will require people who not only turn their resources, but their lives toward building the common, building the shared, building the joined. This moment requires people who refuse gated communities, resist gated lives, and attuned to the wisdom of King, place their lives in the midst of others. In the midst of a distressed environment, in the midst of segregated neighborhoods, in the midst of class division, in the midst of grotesque economic inequalities, and say to themselves, I will be a place that connects. I will be a place of thriving in a place where thriving is a distant memory or not a memory at all. Soon, very soon, you will be faced with a decision you will have to decide whether you will move forward from this moment, this pandemic moment, this Black Lives Matter moment, this grotesque 
inequities, in everything moment. As if it is inconsequential for who you wish to become. Or you will decide that you will move from this moment. Root yourself in a place. And decide to become the person whose very name becomes synonymous with a meeting and a gathering together that others never thought possible, whose very name becomes synonymous with another name that gathers together hopes and dreams rooted in a life that overcame death and promises and overcoming. And my friends, every place needs that person. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. Teach us, O oh God, to say goodbye. It is not easy. We have grown comfortable together, even while grappling over issues that make us uncomfortable. But it is time, time to acknowledge the great diaspora of university graduates who will travel to all corners to build careers, to be faithful lovers, to engage in worthy missions, or to return home and wait restlessly for opportunities to emerge. The way is opening before us. The wilderness beyond is only dimly known. We wish we knew more about the land promised to us, or the journey, or our companions along the way. Here at Wingate University, we have nurtured wisdom and faith. And now we wonder if we have done enough. We have challenged one another to be diligent, but we know that none of us has excelled as much as we had hoped. These have been challenging times, though excuses are not helpful. We believe that virtuous people can flourish in this world and that temptations to sell ourselves and our principles can be resisted. 
And so our prayer is that we will preserve a clear vision of a truly good life, noteworthy for its justice and generosity and communal spirit. Help us to banish the bigotries that we have inherited so they will not plague our children. And may we learn to love our enemies, as Jesus said, and not merely tolerate them. So now we pray that our souls will be renewed with faith, hope, and love. And when we choose careers and neighborhoods and faith communities, we will reveal a strong commitment to social justice and to the common good. As we strive to be people of the book, may we be merciful with all. When sin threatens our relationships, may we forgive and be forgiven. And if conflict engulfs us, may we learn to be peacemakers. It is with deep gratitude for our friends and mentors and all the blessings bestowed upon us in this place that we commit ourselves to divine providence. Amen.